or you had graduation yesterday. How about that? And Pastor was very involved with that. I'm very glad that he was able to do it on in a day, Saturday morning and whew, something else. Well, hopefully you're all aware that we're in uh, 36 days of prayer. And I do see this as like a contending, like we get, um, we get intentional. Things don't just happen to us as believers. There, there's God's part, but there's our part. And uh, right now, I, I consider this to be a time of contending for our church. And so I wanted us to, to do, and, I, and hopefully we'll just do this until the 36 days is up. But let's all stand and let's, uh, if we can, hopefully have the slide. And we're going to pray the prayer together. Slide number one. I'll just pray for that to happen. <laughs> Lord Jesus, help us. Lower thirds. Do we have slide number one? We may be struggling today. But that's okay. We're contending. How's that? We're contending for the promises. Well, I will just pray over you for a minute then. Lord, we thank you for the service today. God, I thank you for the people that are here today. God, I pray today you will speak to them mightily through your word. That God, there'll be a shift in the way that we think today because of this word. That God, you will make a deposit within us to press in for the promises of God, that you'll make a deposit within us, Lord, to bring about the victories, to bring about the triumphs, to loose the blessings, God, in our lives. And I thank you, Lord God, and we will contend for everything that you have for us, God. God, I ask for just the spiritual DNA that you have placed already within us that was in Christ, for the things to be brought about, the will of God, the plans of God, the purposes of God to be brought about in our lives. In your name we pray. There is a little jazzy little tune going up here, and I don't know. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we're just, we're just going to go with it. Uh, they're going to get it fixed. But here, here let's, let's say this together. And uh, Lord, you told us that we could ask for anything. In your, name, in your name, and that you would accomplish it, you would accomplish it. On, our on our behalf. We bring our deepest cares, our deepest cares. To, you to you now, and ask for divine favor today. Ask for divine favor today. We ask for the impossible to be made possible, made possible. By, your power. by your power. Amen. You may be seated. I think there's power in, in people even coming together in unity that it takes to even pray a prayer together. There is power in unity. There's power when there's unity in a home, and there's power when there's unity in a church. And God is bringing a oneness to this church as part of the work that he is doing so that he can release the blessings. There is something that is released in a people that will move together as one. And I'll tell you, God will remove who he has to move, and he will bring in who he needs to move in to accomplish a oneness and a unity in a body so that they can move forward into the things of God. Well, I found an encouraging quote by Smith Wigglesworth, and, I, and it might help make some uh, kind of sense of what we're going through lately, or maybe even what you're going through uh, individually. And it's this, uh, great faith is the product of great fights. I want you to think about this. Because this is, this is what it's going to take in a people, okay? This is what it's going to take in you. Great faith is the product of great fights. Great testimonies are the outcome of great tests. And great triumphs can only come out of great trials. Greatness, then, is the result of all kinds of troubles. Think about it. Fights, tests, and trials have the potential to make one great for God to move you into greatness. And I think a lot of it has to do with how we handle the, the great troubles and trials and tests and the things that come against us. Because we know that Jesus said this here on this earth, you will have many, everybody say many. That's not a few, many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. So Jesus even tells us ahead of time, we are not getting the easy street. I'm astonished at how many people have misperception about following Jesus Christ as being this pain-free journey. If you look in scriptures, the opposite is true. It costs you. It costs you. It costs to be God's child. It costs to be peculiar. 
It cost to be fruitful. It cost to be blessed and highly favored. Yet we, we know that we are called to be blessed. This is part of, I'm telling you, we're called to be blessed, but I want you to understand that it costs something. In the Old Testament stories, you'll, you'll find a blessed person. You'll not find one blessed person, how is that, who did not go through pain and suffering. So if you, if you want your blessings, then you're going to go through pain and suffering. It all has to do about how we go, what it does in us. Because I'm going to tell you, you can let things crush you. You can let things destroy you. You can, you can get into pity and sorrow or bitterness and all those things. But it's the way to blessing. Pain is the cost of blessing. They all paid dearly for the gifts God entrusted to them. They each knew deep sorrow and heartache in their souls. But they allowed God to work in and through it. And it did something. And it, it made them fruitful. It changed even their destiny and who it brought them into fully who they were in God. So today's message, I want to use Jacob. And uh, Jason, Jacob, just so you know, is one of the forefathers of our faith. You know, you'll hear, you'll hear people often say, maybe they're talking about scriptures and things. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, so Abraham is a forefather of the faith, and, but so is Isaac and so is Jacob. And we know that Abraham birthed Isaac, the son of promise, there was also uh, Ishmael came through the servant girl Hagar that Sarah, Sarah had given him. But the pro child of promise was Isaac. So Abraham and Sarah give birth to Isaac, the, the, son, the child of promise. And then, and then from Isaac comes Jacob. And just so you have an idea, a, a blessing, blessing is something that you are to want. Okay, you are to want God's blessing. God wants you to want his blessing. Blessing is just God's undeserved favor and protection, and all the goodness of God in your life, just playing out. So anyway, we get Abraham, Isaac, and then Isaac marries Rebekah, who turns out to also be barren just as Sarah was. And I'll give you a little bit of history because I think we don't have much Bible history in us anymore, <laughs> and we need, to, we need to know the history because the Old Testament and understanding it has everything to do with understanding the New Testament and who you are and who God is for you. So Isaac marries Rebecca, who turns out to be barren, and then Genesis 25 begins the story of Jacob. Jake, uh, Genesis 25, verse 21, says this, Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. Children, The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebecca became pregnant with twins. Verse 22, but the two children struggled with each other in her womb. So she went to the, ask the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me, she asked. And in verse 23, and the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. The one nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve your younger son. And so Isaac and Rebekah give birth to twins. Esau and Jacob are their twins. But God chose Jacob, the younger one, to be blessed. Now think about this. This, this is something mysterious to me because up to then, there's just one Abraham. There's just one Isaac. In, in the womb, and then comes along, God gives twins. Now, he knows that the Lord knows he's only going to bless one of those children, but yet one of them is called into the blessing to be a forefather, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, only one of them. But yet, why does God put two children in that womb? And there, are, there were sibling rivalries from the inception. These two were at war with one another. Sibling rivalry is common in all families today. We know about it. And parents can contribute to the problem as, as Isaac and Rebecca did contribute to the problem with Jacob and Esau. See, Father Isaac favored Esau. Esau was this outdoorsman and he loved the wild game. So Father Isaac loved Esau. But then you have Re Rebecca and she favored Esau, or she favored Jacob, the other son, the younger son. And he's the homebody, kind of stays home with mom and, and uh, around the house more and does those kind of tasks and, and learns to cook and things like this. I want you to understand this story because it's important to your life. One day, Esau comes home. He's ravishingly home. He's uh, starving. I don't know if you've ever been so hungry. You just feel like you could chew your arm off. I mean, it was just kind of hungry. He'd been out hunting all day, caught nothing. He comes back and he is starving. He gets back and, and there's Jacob. He has this stew brewing and Esau smells it and his appetite is just like, I got to have that right now. And Jacob took advantage of the situation. He sees his brother starving and he says, you can have some of this if you just give me your birthright. 
And so he make, they make a deal that day. And Jacob gives him stew for his birthright. But Genesis 25, 34 says this. Esau, he showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. Contempt means just disrespect, disdain, scoff. Think, he, show, he showed disrespect for what was his, what was rightfully his. And then sometime later in Genesis 27, when Isaac is getting old and going blind, he sends Esau out to find some wild game and prepare a meal so that he can give him this blessing that's supposed to be his. Even though Esau already had given it to Jacob, Esau don't bother to tell daddy that. And whether daddy knows, I don't know. But he goes out to get the game. And while he's gone, Rebecca schemes. And she says, Jacob, Esau's gone. He's been ready to get this blessing. I need you to go in there. I need you to get ahead of him. So they prepare a meal and they get in there ahead and they trick and they deceive before Esau gets back. He gets the blessing. He gets the blessing ahead of him. But we know from the beginning, Rebecca already knew that Jacob was the one that was supposed to get the blessing. Now, whether there's communication going on between the two, I don't know. And none of that matters. But what I want you to know this is God wants you to want what he has for you. He wants you to want what he has for you. Jacob knew that that was supposed to be his. He knew. And I'll tell you what, he wanted it. There was two in that womb, but one wanted it more than the other. There was fighting going on in that womb from the beginning. There was something that God was doing from Jacob, even from inception. There was a deposit being made in him to fight for what God had for him. Jacob understood how one blessing from God would change his life. He had so much respect for the blessing of God on his life that even though he deceived for it, he had a desire and a want to. And I'll tell you, both of them were deeply flawed individuals. Esau lacked passion for his inheritance. Esau easily sold out for it over a meal. He doesn't value the birthright. He sold out something that was worth everything for one meal. Jacob had desire. It burned within him. And even though Jacob took advantage of Esau physically, and, and we, know, we think, wow, he took advantage of his hunger, he desired to be blessed by God. And I think God saw something in him. He valued that birthright. And Jacob had faith in God's word, knowing when God blessed his work, he would experience a supernatural abundance in his life. When he sowed, he was going to reap many times over. And I want you to understand that this is our heritage, Jacob. There is something in Jacob that needs to be in us. There's something in us that God even approved of it. Because the want to in him is something he needs to see in us. And Galatians 3, 28 and 29 says this. This is New Testament, and I take you here to understand because you think, well, that's Old Testament. What does that matter? Well, New Testament talks about this. It says, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Now, why would he say there's no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male or female? Because in Christ, we are all firstborn sons. We all have a birthright because we've all been placed in Christ who we know is the only begotten son of God. He is firstborn. And we put on Christ when we receive him and we become firstborn sons with a birthright to receive the promises of God. This is what Christ did for us. And you don't have to be a firstborn son in your family because you are born by the blood of Jesus. And he has given you this right. And we need to understand who we are as the blessed seed of Abraham. We need to understand that the promises are not just for other folks or people that stand on the platform and speak. That they are actually for you. They are actually for you. But I believe the nature of Jacob is going to have to rise up in us. Because, because of Jesus, this is our birthright. This is our right. You can be Abraham's seed, though, and not receive the blessing that God has for you. Simply because you don't think 
that maybe it's yours, you don't realize it, you don't know it, you know, people perish for a lack of knowledge, but also you may not value it. You can be like Esau. You don't think it's important whether or not God blesses your life. And you treat God's gift with contempt. But God wants you to value what he has for you. God wants you to want what he has for you. He wants you to have a desire in you that's strong like Jacob. Now the story continues. Now Jacob has to flee because Esau wants to kill him because he stole this birthright. And on his way to Rebekah's brother's house, which is where he was fleeing in another city, he spends the night. Genesis 28, 10, let's read about it. Meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba and traveled to Haran. And at sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and he stopped there for the night. And as he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from the earth to heaven. And he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. And, and this, and we see really is an open heaven. Like there's a connection because of his obedience. There begins to be a connection between heaven and earth because of Jacob, the call on his life. And then God confirms at the top of the stairway stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather, Abraham, and the God of your father, Isaac. And God says this to you today. Listen, the ground you are lying on belongs to you and I'm giving it to you and your descendants. I want you to know that the earth belongs to God and God has a right to give it to his children. And I believe the land is actually ours. And I believe that God is actually gonna place us in a certain place in the city. And that land is ours and we're called to it. And he's gonna establish his kingdom and open heaven there. In verse 14, he goes on to say, God speaks and goes, your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions, to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. I still think this is God's plan for his people. What's more, I'm with you and I'll protect you wherever you go. This is a promise over your life. He says, I'm with you as you move with him, as you're obedient with him, as you do and go with God. This is a promise. He says, I'm going to protect you. The ground you're lying on belongs to you. I'm giving it to you and your descendants. If your descendants will be numerous as the dust of the earth, they will spread out in all directions. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through your descendants. What's more, I am with you and I will protect you wherever you go. One day I will bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I have finished giving you everything I promised you. Now I, I believe that we are promised everything. Every promise in, in the word is ours. Every promise in Christ. Yes and amen. So Jacob flees to Haran, lives with his father-in-law, uh, or uh, Laban there, Rebecca's brother, and spends 20 years in tests and trials with this man who deceives him, who tricks him continually. He sees the blood, and, and I tell you, he's favored even during this exile. Everything he touches multiplies. And the, and the more it multiplies, the more jealousy there is in Laban and Laban's son because this Jacob is just experiencing the favor of God. And there he marries Rachel and Leah, and it's too much to all talk about. But it comes a time when God tells Jacob then to return back home, as he told him. And it's like 20 years later, two decades later. Two decades of tests and trials. And then so Jacob flees from Laban because things get difficult there. And, but then he sends messengers ahead to let Esau know, hey, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming back to the land. Messengers return to informing Jacob that Esau is coming with an army of 400 men. And that just terrifies Jacob even the more. I mean, it says there's an army of men that are 400 men are coming. You know what? I don't think this is a greeting committee. I, 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 think, I think Esau is remembering how he left and he's coming with an army. But Jacob knows what to do. He's terrified. He knows what, I hope you know what to do when you're terrified. In Genesis 32, nine, it says, then Jacob prayed Oh, God of my grandfather Abraham and God of my father Isaac. Oh, Lord, you told me. Now, listen, this is what you do with God. You say, Lord, you told me. You told me this. God, remember when you said this? Like, I was obedient. I moved here. Now, you know, I was obedient, God. I was moving with you. He said, oh, Lord, you told me. Return to your own land and to your relatives. And you promised me I will treat you kindly. He goes on to say, I'm not worthy of all the unfailing love and faithfulness you have shown me. See the humility there, your servant? When I left home and crossed the Jordan River, I owned nothing except a walking stick. Now my household fills two large camps. The blessings of the Lord were already upon him. 
as he was moved there, but now he's moving back. And he goes on to say, oh Lord, please rescue me from the hand. Do you know who to go to when you need to be rescued? Do you know? Do you know who your God is? He's the one who rescues. Rescue me from my hand of my brother Esau. I'm afraid that he's coming to attack me along with my wives and my children. But you promised me. Here he is. But you promised me, God. I will surely treat you kindly and I will multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as the sands along the seashore. Too many to count. I want you to know that God wants to make us a people that are fruitful. He wants us to make us a people that are fruitful. He wants your life to cause multiplication. He won't only multiply what you have. He wants you to, to reproduce other people, to reproduce people who are full of faith in God. He wants you to reproduce, and so he's putting faith in you, even now through what you're going through. So Jacob sent gifts ahead to meet Esau. He's no dummy. He sent gifts, like he's sending all these gifts to him. And then there's a second encounter. But it goes, it goes well with Esau. Esau decides he don't want to fight. And I really think it was God's answer to prayer. So he don't fight. He welcomes him back. There's a hug. There's an embrace. But we're going to move on because I want to talk to you about the second encounter. But God moved for him. Just know God moved for him when he cried out. And he'll move for you. There's a second encounter. Jacob continues he continues to move back home and go back home, but um, on, on his own with his family. And he sends his, he sends his it, during the, it's, it's nighttime and he separates from his wives and his children and, and, he, and, he, and he stays in camp by himself. And just so he can be alone. And in Genesis 32, 24 through 28, there's a second encounter when Jacob spends the night alone. This, this left Jacob alone in the camp, sent his wife, his children away to, to camp away from him. And during the night, a man came now, some say this man was Jesus. Some say it was an angel. We really don't know. But there, there's many that believe there's appearances of Jesus in the Old Testament. So very well could have been Jesus. But a man came and wrestled with him until dawn began to break. And when the man saw that he could not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of socket. Then the man said, let go of me for dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Is there anybody in here that is willing to say that to the Lord? I will not let you go till you bless me. You see, we'll go on. What is your name? The man asked. And he replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob. Here's his blessing, the man told him. From now on, you'll be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Israel means God's fights, God fights or he who fights with God. Now I'm gonna take you back to that womb. There was a reason there was two in that womb because God was putting a fight in one of them. He was putting a fight in one of them. And I believe that that angel, Jesus, whoever it was that met him that night, came for one reason and one reason only. It was not to have a good talk. It was not to, to uh, give him a word or, or anything like that. He came for one reason and one reason only. He came to fight. You see, God was checking if Jacob had actually, through all of his 20 years of tests and trials, had had a tenaciousness and a fight to rise up in him who would say, I will not let go until I have the blessings. Until you bless me. You see, in this 36 days that we're going through right now, there needs to be a contending that rises up to you. And I'm believing God that today he's depositing in you the ability to begin to contend and say, I will not let go till you release my blessings. <laughs> Hear me, there are blessings for your life. Many people will never get them because they do not have the attitude in the heart of a contender that Jacob had. And God is looking for a people who will contend for God's will, for his promises and his plans for their life, who want to see their children prosper, that are willing to fight so that the next generation, their children and their children's children will know God and walk and live in the promises that he has for them. There has to be a generation and a people who will first do the fight part. And we are called to it. I believe it's in our spiritual DNA. God doesn't seem to mind that Jacob contends with him. In fact, he seems to approve it. In fact, it seems that that's the whole reason why he came. He came to wrestle with Jacob. He wanted to see what was in him. 
And then he gave him a reminder. And I think God doesn't punish Jacob for wrestling him. He just wrenches his, sock, his hip out, socket out, dislocated his hip, and subdued him before he blessed him. Now, I don't know what you're going through, but I suspect that some of us are being subdued before God blesses us. He's going to make you trustworthy of that blessing. He's going to give you something. You are never going to forget what he did for you. I believe it. I believe it. God is going to mark you forever for him. You're going to walk with a reminder from then on. Who you are, you're never going to forget. You're never going to forget what it cost you. It cost to be a peculiar people. I want, to hear, I want you to hear, say it cost. It cost. It costs to be fruitful. It costs to be blessed. It costs you something to be God's child. God was establishing a people who would contend with him for blessings. That's what this 36 days is about. Get on board with the contending if you're not. Remember, tell God you promised. You promised, you'd always, you promised Jacob you'd always be with him. You promised God. And I'm Abraham's seed, so that promise is mine. You promised Look and find and discover all the things that are promised in his word. When Jacob returns to Bethel, the place of his dream of the ladder, and God first spoke to him, he has another encounter. Now he's on the way back. In Genesis 35, 9, it said, God appeared to him again at Bethel. God blessed him again, saying, your name is Jacob, but you will not be called Jacob any longer. From now on, your name will be Israel. So God renamed him Israel. And when God tells you something twice, like he really means it, he's saying, God fights. You're a fighter. You're a fighter. I want to run you. You're not, you're not Jacob anymore. You're a fighter. You're a fighter. Don't forget. And God confirms this name change. Jacob is to see himself as a fighter who is blessed. Israel, one who fights in him, is not passive. Then God said to this, he goes on to tell him, I'm, I tell you who you are. I'm going to remind you again. You're Israel. You're a fighter. And I'm going to tell you who I'm going to be for you. Then God said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. I'm the one who fights for you. I'm the one who can see you through. I'm the one who never fails. I mean, when he's saying El Shaddai, it's, all the, it's supreme. It's king over all. It's Lord over all. God Almighty. And he says to him, be fruitful and multiply. God intends for us to reproduce as a people. You will become a great nation, even many nations. Kings will be among your descendants. And I will give you the land I once gave to Abraham and Isaac. Yes, I will give it to you and your descendants after you. God wants us to have a place in which we are fruitful and we multiply and we impact a city. Now that you are Israel, a new identity in relation to God, who I created you to be through all your tests and trials, Israel, a contender for the things of God, I will be your El Shaddai, where nothing is impossible. Never failing, always victorious, always triumphant. I am capable and able, he's letting him know. God wants you to be passionate about who he is and what he has for you. He wants to be El Shaddai for you. And I think our image of God is just way too small. We don't think God is capable of really doing the miracles anymore. I mean, we, we've really taken our attitude that we made God into our own image. And, and God wants to lift that off of us today. God is a fighting God. He fights for his people. If God fights for you, you cannot lose. It's in your spiritual DNA to fight. We do our part, he does his part. Now, I'm not talking about arguing about other people, with other people or arguing even with God, but remind God of what he's promised you. And I'm not talking about physical fights because we're not fighting against flesh and blood other people. They're under the influence many times in the sway of the God of this world. That's not what we're here to fight with. But be tenacious about God's will and his purposes. Be fixed in your faith. Don't waver. Don't be double-minded. Never give up. Keep fighting in prayer till you see the promises come through. It was two decades in which Jacob was in turmoil and test and trials. And then they didn't end with that. He comes back and he's got to face all the stuff with Esau. It doesn't stop. But God has to build a tenacity within you that you live with. What cost you something, you will value. What cost you something, you will fight to hold on to. You can actually get the promises and, and just go passive and lose it all. And God hates passivity and God loves passion. Maintaining your faith is a fight. It's a fight to get into the place of faith. And I'm gonna tell you, every time you get bad news, every time you get bad report, and listen, they're gonna come 
And the facts are discouraging. The facts always say no hope. The facts always say you're, you're, you're done for, it's over. And you've got to decide at that point if you're gonna go by the facts or you're gonna go by faith because you cannot do both. You cannot do both. You just can't, you have to choose. You are Abraham's seed, you've been promised blessing and you are a contender for those blessings. Scripture tells us the story that Jacob uh, had, did to become a nation. And we know he had 12 sons and 12 tribes. They ended up, now you know, if you know the story, and I'll help you with the history, Jacob ends up having 12 sons and they become the 12 tribes of Israel. You know the story of Joseph? One of those sons is Joseph. He get, the brothers hate him, throw him into captivity. I'm giving you this for a reason. They throw him away, sell him into slavery. He gets, he gets taken to Egypt. He, he's there a couple decades suffering through imprisonment and, and slavery. And then what happens is God takes him from the prison to the palace. And one day he becomes the second highest reigning there uh, with Pharaoh, Pharaoh over Egypt. And because of that, he's able to save all of his brothers and during the great famine. So God prepared a way through even Joseph's suffering and this happens. But then 400 years old, later, the Pharaoh no longer remembers what Joseph did and no one knows the story of Joseph and all the people become in captivity there. I'm telling you this story for a reason. Moses comes and gets them out, right? Moses is the deliverer and takes them. But because they rebel against God, because they're not willing to contend for the promises, they end up 40 years wandering around the wilderness. But then there was a Joshua amongst them. And Joshua was one of those 10 spies, right? And Joshua and Caleb, they were fighters. They were contenders. They saw the promises and they knew they could obtain them if they would just fight for them. So it's actually Joshua who will lead them into the promised land that they will have to fight their enemies and they'll have to defeat them. They had to defeat the Edomites. You know who the Edomites were? Esau's descendants. They also had to, they had to defeat the Ishmaelites, <laughs> Ishmael's descendants, Abraham's other son, right? God's gifts are free, but it's going to cost you something. And you've got to decide if you've got a tenacity within you, which you do if you've received Christ. It's in your DNA, your spiritual DNA. It's already there from the forefathers of our faith to contend because we have El Shaddai, God Almighty, who is on our side, and God keeps his promises. He blesses those faithful to him. He blesses those willing to contend. He blesses those people who will never give up. You may have to fight for two decades for something. You're going to have to decide whether you are willing to do what it takes to see your children and your children's children know Christ. Contend for the promises of God. And I'm calling you into contending today. Contenders like Jacob never give up. They hold on to Jesus until they receive God's blessing. The promise of God are not for the faint of heart, are not for weaklings, are not for passive, passionless people. They're for those who are fixed on Jesus. They're fixed on the prize. Amen, amen. If you receive this word today, I'm going to ask for Pastor Mike to come. This is an exciting day. I preach hard and fast. I believe God's made a deposit within you today. You are contenders from here on. Once you see yourself different, you're, you're warriors. You're called into war. You're called into a battle. But there's no way you can lose it. Ron, El Shaddai is on your side. Whoa. Oh, that's all right. Good. In fact, Amen. Ron, if we could slide that over here. Uh, Thank you, Ron. That's okay. I have to do that at the house with her all the time. She just leaves <laughs> stuff everywhere. Okay. Would you thank God for this Amen. word today? Can thank I you, give man. you a high five? Wow. Thank you, bro. Yeah, we're good. Thank you. Thanks for serving and helping us. And uh, wow, what a, what a message. What a word. What a, uh, I've just blown away, blown away, blown away blown away by that. Hallelujah. Whew. He's in the room. Now today, what I'm going to talk to you about is I'm going to help you contend in a very practical way of what God has for you and what God has for your family. You know, if, if you lose, your family loses. If you give up, your family will be impacted. But if you persist and lean in and get what God has for you, your family will be blessed. 
Amen. And so um, this morning, I'm rolling out for you. We've been talking about this. Now, I have personally been talking about this moment. It's probably why I'm so emotional. For about 20 years, for about 20 years, I've talked about a church that would shift in its mindset, and you've heard me preach it ad nauseum. You've heard me preach it, preach it, preach it, preach it, preach it. <laughs> and now you're going to see us do it. We are getting ready in our spirits to make a shift into the downtown season of all that God has. We don't even know where God has us to go. But I know this. It's more important to build the people than it is to build a steeple. Americans live with this idea of conversion theology, which basically says if you just say something, then it's just uh, um, taken care of as it relates to your salvation. But, but salvation and coming to faith in Jesus is more like a sunrise than it is a single moment in history. And transformation is that journey to faith. And following Jesus is not easy, it's hard. And so the ministry we're going to roll out today is a ministry for you. That we are uh, going to um, expand our ability to minister to what's going on in your life. God has always wanted a people to uh, reflect his heart to the nations to the people around them. But God's people, all of God's people, are broken and wounded, full of life's pollution, and we are all in need of repair and, and wholeness. And so um, one of the key things that we wanted to implement this morning is to say, look, we're a family. Now, how many know when you're a family, you don't get to pick family, you just have family, amen? And you always have, you always have people in the family will say, now that person's odd in the family. You know, but that's what they say about you when you're not listening. <laughs> we're really what we're saying is we're all unique. We're all at different places. So being a part of this church family doesn't mean that you're a member of the church. That's that's in a, in a technical thing. It's a whole nother category. We're not even talking about that. We're we're talking about if you're a family, it means that you join with us in our neediness, in journeying together, taking hands together to become the visible church of Jesus. And so after a person accepts the truth of the message, they hear it, they confess Jesus with their mouth according to Romans 10, there are still deep, vast issues that have to be dealt with and, and uh, worked through and even issues that are unresolved that need resolution. And, and a Sunday morning worship service won't just take care of that. So following Christ and being baptized is only the start of a more in-depth healing that needs to be done by the Holy Spirit. And so uh, here's what I would say to you. I was saved at the age of five, and I was as sincere as why I believe in kids' ministry, called at the age of 12, 11 or 12, to uh, go into the ministry. But all I could do is give as much as myself as I understood at the time to as much of God as I could understand at the time. And that's what it means when you come to faith at whatever age level, you come to him and you give all of your heart to him as much as you understand about yourself, as much as you understand. And so today I'm going to uh, introduce to you uh, chaplains. You have this card that you received on the way in. This is our first uh, installment, the first season of chaplains that we're uh, bringing to you and sharing with you. I'm going to invite to the stage uh, right now Danny and Chrissy Bass, if they would join me. Here on the stage, Danny and Chrissy Bass, if you would come. These are veteran missionaries. They, uh, um, Danny has a license with the Assemblies of God. Come right over here, Danny and Chrissy. Pastor Clint, thank you. I didn't see you. I was looking for you. So you, are, you did make it. You're here. And um, these uh, um, beautiful people are going to uh, help us. And um, if you'll notice, each of the chaplains have a specific area of focus where they want to minister in, the, in, in that lane and, and help you. And, and I'm going to talk about each uh, one of them as, as, uh, as they come up. Uh, Boris and Melissa Elder, if you would join us. Danny and Chrissy are going to focus on uh, freedom from sexual brokenness. Uh, Danny uh, will be forming groups of men that will come together and talk about, receive God's instruction, 
his guidance, his prayer support to move in God's freedom. And Pastor Clint and myself are going to provide leadership and help and uh, coaching, uh, if we can, uh, to these uh, beautiful people. Uh, Boris and Melissa will focus on helping um, um, marriages grow stronger. That's what they've been doing for 35. They've been married 35 years. They've been doing it here at the church as long as I've been here. But uh, one of the key things, yes, say a thank you to them as well. But if you, uh, if you know someone that's getting married or needs premarital, that is one of the major emphasis uh, here that you uh, can uh, reach out to them. And I'll, I'll uh, tell you how to reach out in, in a moment. Coming next is uh, Daryl. Daryl and Christy, farewell. Daryl is a, a, a pastor at heart. He actually, you wouldn't know this, but he is at our pastoral staff meeting every Tuesday. Um, and uh, they are uh, helping our team in many, many ways. Spoke to our uh, board, uh, the entire board of the church on uh, last Sunday night. Um, their mission is to facilitate uh, reconciliation. And um, they are focused on areas of ethnicity, social, economic status, and gender. And um, they are very experienced, 20 years, over 20 years of ministry experience um, in them. Let's welcome them. And so where and how can the average uh, WSF attender grow, be transformed, experience God's deeper power at work in their lives? How can people participate in this church family uh, when their own conscience tells them, I, I do so many wrong things or I messed up in so many ways, I don't feel like I can be a part of the family, I'm not worthy. And these, these chaplains are gonna be able to help you understand that the process the process of growth is that Jesus doesn't fix you, Jesus grows you. You're not a car to be fixed. You're not a computer uh, to be repaired. You understand? So a computer has memory, but you're a human being and you have memories. And those memories uh, have, have to uh, um, ultimately be interpreted and play a purpose uh, in, in what God has for you. The next uh, uh, person to join us on the stage is, is one of our deaconesses, uh, Nalitza Gonzalez, if Nalitza would come. Nalitza is a Christ follower with a testimony of forgiveness and healing. She has decades of experience working with young people and families. Um, she is a licensed professional counselor, licensed marriage and family therapist. And uh, she has been talking to me about this for years, seven years probably or something, and she's patiently waited, patiently waited. And I'm gonna say more about all of them in, in, in just a moment. Uh, David Henson is not gonna join us on stage. Are you gonna join us on stage? Okay, uh, David, if you would just stand. In fact, you and Joyce both stand if you would. I just want you to see David already serves in this role and uh, is one of our pastors on staff. Would you thank David? And you can see all that David does. But David, um, David is our generalist, so David, uh, and I, I want to read this about him, but he and his wife, Joyce, moved to Winston-Salem in 86 to launch a non-denominational church called New Life Community Church, and later became Crossfire Church, and uh, grew that uh, from four to 400, but for me, the more significant piece is that it was in the middle of the city. Uh, they felt that God was doing something, and so David uh, works with us, serves with us, and uh, many of you have already been ministered to by him, and he'll show up. When, when the news is difficult and hard for you. And, and so thank you, David, for, for being a part of that. Barbara Lemon, if you would come and join us. Barbara is a mentor for Journey to Heal, Seven Essential Steps for Recovery for Survivors of Childhood Sexual Abuse. Uh, she is a volunteer with Forsyth Family. Let's welcome her. She is a volunteer for, uh, with Forsyth Family Services, Domestic Violence, and Sexual Assault uh, Crisis Lines, as well as Victim service practitioner uh, with North Carolina Victim Assistance Next, uh, Network. She has received volunteer training regarding the sexual assault domestic violence by Forsyth County Family Services, including the ADA, Forsyth County Police Department, and uh, has been uh, trained at the North Carolina Justice Academy. So uh, we're grateful. And it's important to understand, so each one of the chaplains, so uh, Clint, Clint and I sat down and, and and really, Clint was just trying to pull out of me, what's the vision, what's the vision, what's the vision? We were going through it, going through it. And, and it was such a brilliant thing that God used. And Pastor Clint said these words to me. He said, 
God already has experts in certain fields that are sitting in the pews. And so this vision for chaplains is ready to go. We can, we can get there, Pastor. We can get there. And so, uh, uh, and, and right underneath us, uh, is someone are already trained on all of these certifications that are here in their own uh, area. Another one that's a little bit unusual, but uh, if you need it, is someone really to stand in the gap for you. Her name is Stacy Skradsky. You know her and Mark uh, very well. have been a part of the church for a long time. Stacy, if you would come, let's welcome Stacy to the stage. She is a, a gap stander. And the more I get to know Stacy, the more I uh, have a deep, deep respect and admiration for what she does. Uh, adv advocacy comes in many forms and is a method uh, to stand in the gap with and for individuals in need. Advocacy can come through education, referrals, encouragement, and the like. But it's a way for our church family to uh, come together to meet the needs of the rest of the family. Uh, family is about belonging, and belonging means you have to have somebody advocating to let them in uh, to that place. And so Stacy has been privileged to work within the adult mental health, intellectual development, disability, substance abuse area. Most of her professional career, she has worked in private and public sectors, both in the inpatient and outpatient settings, and currently works in the field of adult guardianship. All right? Each one of these has more. And then last that I want to bring to the stage, uh, this young couple uh, came and, and spoke with me uh, some time ago. And uh, the more they talked, the more I just uh, not only was moved by the Holy Spirit, but I knew that this is going to be a growing need. And I'm gonna ask you to uh, help me welcome Brian and Brianna Sparrow, um, and Brianna to come to the stage. And in many ways, this couple are going to be a resource for those of you that are navigating complicated issues related to um, people from other religions that are in your family or uh, people that are far from God, people that are struggling with uh, various issues or ways in which you're navigating. In fact, uh, Pastor Clint, if you're down there, could you hand the microphone just to, yeah, could you explain what in the world you're going to uh, serve to Brianna there? So the Lord um, began to work with us just actually just from the onset of our relationship, just on authenticity and intentionality. Um, and so that's kind of what we're focusing on uh, is just helping us and believers alike create an intentionality with the people around them. So the people that they work with, the people that their kids play soccer with, um, but realizing that in order for us to be a light, you have to have a relationship because nobody wants to listen to you if you don't invest in their lives. Um, and so just knowing that that could take a week, that could take six months, that could take 10 years, but all of it would be worth the deposit and worth the investment. Thank you. So in your mind now, what I need you to see up here is each one of these uh, are specialists. All right. So each one has certifications. Uh, Pastor uh, uh, Danny's um, growth continues uh, in this ability just basically to rescue men. Chrissy's coming alongside because that had the, when men are impacted, women are impacted. And so they'll be rolling out classes or small groups or whatever it is the Holy Spirit tells them to do. We're not prescribing from here what the Spirit wants to do through them. Can you say amen? Now, uh, I'm going uh, uh, to ask, um, I have, well, i tell you what, um, I'm going to have the elders come, if you would. The elders of our church uh, that are here, would you come and stand behind these chaplains? All the elders that are here, if you would come. Sister Mary don't need the help up, but she, it's like, it's classy to have some help. She runs circles around these young people, let me tell you. Have the elders come. Now, there are three main connection points for you to grow and be a part of the family. The first is, you come to the kingdom by hearing and believing. And you step across that line. And then you grow by regularly attending church. You've got to get in church if you're going to grow. But that third step is what we're talking about today, which is you intentionally engage to say, God, I want to participate with your transforming power in my life. And whatever that looks like, I'm going to engage. So uh, just a couple of more thoughts before we pray. 
So we are now providing practical ways for you to handle overwhelming times and keep growing on your faith journey. You are not, you are not a person that needs to be fixed. You are a, a, a human being in the process of being transformed to be more and more and more like Jesus. So even though they are experts in their field, what they're going to do is, is pretty specific. The first thing they're gonna do is help you with any private pain that you have going on in any of these areas. Areas that you would be, you say, I'm not gonna talk to a pastor, there's no way. But we're gonna uh, tell you in a second how you can reach to these folks and they, they will help you. Secondly, chaplains plant seeds of healing inside that brokenness, that ground that's been broken up, that they will plant seeds of healing. And it may take time. There's no one liner or no one hour that's just gonna all of a sudden, whoo, that's it, that's all I needed. It, no, they are saying to you, this is a journey. It hurts, it's painful, but God will meet you along that way. And third, they will help you experience God's transforming power through groups, through sessions, through classes, through the email or, or whatever. And so um, to, each of, to each of them uh, this, uh, this morning, um, Gary, could you, could you uh, bring up that box that's right there on the front row to me? If you could just uh, come and help me. These are uh, business cards that we have printed up for, uh, for our chaplains. And when you come and see them, when, when you talk to them, if you'll just stand there a second, and Pastor Clint, if you'll help me, here are the, here are the farewells if you give that to them. And uh, Brian, there's Danny. Here you go, Danny and Stacy. And Lisa and Melissa. All right. That's for Daryl. One's for Christy, so. Thanks, Gary, you can go back, thanks. Barbara, there we go. And then Boris and Chrissy. What we're gonna do when we lay hands on them as elders, I wanted them to be holding their business cards. So you understand, the, these folks work uh, mainstream jobs. They, they are not paid by the church, okay? But they have said, God has called me to help. So we're gonna pray, and we're gonna pray over the cards that they hold because when you catch them this week, next month, uh, next year, and you, you see them say, hey, can we talk? They're probably gonna hand you a card and say, hey, email me. Now here's a couple of things. Chaplains, I'm giving you permission because I've been doing church work a long time. Number one, just be truth tellers. Tell them the truth. If they email you about how to buy a used car, you say, I don't do that, okay? So you help them understand, this is the lane I'm in. I'm happy to pass this along, all right? So they, they are not here to just be a shoulder to cry on. They're gonna tell you the truth. If they, if they can't help you, they're gonna, they're gonna try and recommend a resource where you can get help, amen, all right? Um, and so it's important. So I'm giving you the truth. You're gonna hurt feelings in the process. This is, we're dealing with human beings, okay? So I give you permission to hurt people's feelings. Not intentionally, but just tell the truth, all right? Look to your neighbor out there and say, okay, I got it, Pastor, I got it. Second uh, is that we're looking for spiritual transformation. So if it feels like this, this person is not, you know, not ready, it's okay for, for you to say to them what it is the Spirit is telling you to say to them. So we've given them on these business cards uh, we've, we provided a church email for them. And so you will email, email the church on that. All right, are we ready to pray? Would you stand? Elders, if you would step forward. I've got anointing oil. I'm just gonna move down the line. Pastor Clint is gonna come or is gonna pray a prayer and reach up into heaven for a covering for these chaplains that he's gonna oversee and minister to and coach and help. And he very much, Pastor Clint, I haven't said much, but he's not only educated uh, in this area and uh, counseling degrees and all of that and now working on his doctorate, but um, God has a, a, a real heart, put a heart 
in him to help people move from where they are to where God has them. And so as we pray, we're also praying over every one of the cards, the business cards, okay? Because represented on those cards are people that are gonna take a card that are desperate. They have nowhere else to go. They, they, they're suffering in silence or secrecy. And we are just pulling back the mask on what it means to follow Jesus. We're all broken. We're all in need of help, amen? And so we're, this is kind of a get real moment for us as a church. Can you say amen? All right, Pastor Clint, we pray. Father, we're so grateful that you have placed gifts and talents in this local body of Christ's followers. We thank you for it, God. And now, God, we dedicate these lives unto you. We have been declaring for many weeks now that you are the God of the impossible, that all things are possible with you. God, we understand that, yet there are times when you call others to be the hands and the feet of Jesus, to be Jesus with skin on, to minister to other brothers and sisters in Christ, and to minister to those that are far away from you. And we just pray blessings and consecration upon each one of these men and women that are giving their time, their resources, their efforts, their talents, their giftings, their abilities, so that others may receive healing and restoration so that others that do not know the way can be shown the way to real living, to a life that's found in you, to be able to function in their sphere of influence in such a way that would honor you. I pray, God, for each one of these chaplains that as they minister to people that are in this local church and outside these walls, that they would be just a mouthpiece for your Holy Spirit's presence to minister, to guide, and direct. We're asking, oh God, that this ministry would be a ministry for days, weeks, years to come of lives being transformed and aligned, God, to your perfect will and purpose for each life. Yes. Guide, oh Lord, lead, oh God, Spirit and power each one of these chaplains to do the work of the ministry, to go, God, where maybe no one's gone before, to go out of the way where no one has gone out of the way for someone needing help. We pray, oh, Father, that you would do that through these chaplains, that they, oh, God, may be about your business. And in doing so, God, lives are changed forever. And we thank you for it, God, because all the glory goes to you and all the honor goes to you so father what is impossible make possible hallelujah in each life we pray yes in jesus name we ask these things amen hallelujah amen amen, amen.